Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My name is Habib Megji. I'm one of the volunteers with the Hajj Assistance Services and Hajj Assistance Committee. So inshallah, it's my job to welcome you all. Uh, for those who are present here at the Masumin Islamic Center in Toronto, in Brampton, Canada. And we do have a number of our online viewers from the US and also from the UK. So we would like to welcome our online viewers as well. So Hajj Assistance Services and Hajj Assistance Committee is an organization or organizations which have been formed by the volunteers to serve the Hujjaj who go for the pilgrimage every year. Alhamdulillah, this organization has existed for many, many, many years. And the founding members, most of them have passed away. So can I request the Surah Fatiha for all those uh, people who have served the Hujjaj for the past, and also for all our Marhumins, Suratul Mubarakatul Fatiha. So most of you received the program for this afternoon uh, via email. So inshallah, we will start with a lecture by Akil by Karim. Uh, with, he will cover the fiqh and spiritual aspects of all the rituals we do during the Hajj time. Uh, historically, we normally split the fiqh aspects and spiritual aspects, but this year we have given him the challenge to cover both. Now, how many of you are going to Hajj for the first time? Just show your hands. Did you see the hands? OK, thank you. How many of you have been to Umrah before? OK, so quite a few. This is good. OK. So there's lots and lots of materials that will be covered today. Now, by show of hands, can we see how many of you have visited hajjguide.org? That's the website where there's so much reference material. All right, so that's good. So at least you are familiar with the material we will be covered today. So what we have is approximately an hour to an hour, 15 minutes, where Akil will cover the spiritual and the, the uh, fiqh aspects of the Hajj missiles and rituals. Then we'll open up for Q&A, so you'll be able to un, you know, ask questions. And the idea is for you not to be overwhelmed with the material we will cover today because there will be ample time in Medina, right, where you will be hearing the same information again in a little bit more depth in each area. And then we'll complete the, the Umrah at Tamatu. And then for Hajj at Tamatu, we, once we are in Makkah, again, there'll be seminars and lectures going on to cover the Hajj aspects in even more detail, right? So today, the idea is to, for you to grasp as much as you can. And then, inshallah, we expect you to do a little bit of homework in terms of reading, visiting the website and doing your own preparation for this very spiritual trip. And inshallah, once the Q&A is over, then I will cover the, sp the, the logistics aspects of your trip, inshallah. And then uh, in that, I will come and address, and we'll cover some more questions and answers which all of you may have. Right? So inshallah, with uh, Nare Salawat, please welcome Akhil Karim. And, and during the trip, also, you'll be accompanied by quite a few scholars, right, who both in the ladies and gents, so they'll also be scholars with the group, inshallah, so to help you and guide you accordingly. Okay, so one loud salaw as Wakil, please. Alhamdulillahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafaa wa salamun ala ibadihi al-ladhin astafa. 
محمد و علی بیت الطیبین الطاہرین الدین اذہب اللہ عنہم الرجس و طہرہم تطہیرہ اللہم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم اما بعد فقط قال اللہ عز و جل فی کتابه المجید و فرقانه الحمید و قوله الحق و هو اصدق القائلین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وللہ علی الناس حج البیت من استطاع سبیل آمنتو باللہ صدق اللہ العلی العظیم He said once a lot for me, please. <laughs> As uh, Habib Bai mentioned, you know, traditionally we, uh, we break the seminar into two with the first 35-40 minutes uh, to cover the spiritual dimension of the various arkan and rituals of hajj. Uh, and then I traditionally speak on the masail for about an hour, hour 15 minutes, uh, sometimes longer. Um, and so we've been given the task of compressing all of this into one session. So I'm going to run through this material as quickly as I can, uh, covering or, or trying to highlight just uh, the important details. Um, and then, inshallah, we can cover the rest in Q&A um, and the rest, inshallah, in, uh, in Medina and Mecca uh, with uh, the scholars present there, inshallah, as well. Um, a couple of other sort of fine uh, uh, fine points to the presentation. One is that I'm covering the Masail based on the rulings of uh, Ayatollah Al-Udama Sayyid Sistani. Um, for those of you who are, are, are there any others who are muqallideen of other maraja? Uh, Aghai Khamenei, for example. Uh, yes. Yeah, any, any uh, who are the maraja that you're following? If, if you don't mind me asking, because that way it allows us to prepare for uh, the various maraja uh, that we need to have the masail covered for. For the, for the most part, uh, most of the maraja are aligned as far as the masail of hajj are concerned. There are some differences for those, for, for example, the elderly who are still uh, followers of Sayyid al Khui, Rahmatullah Alayh. Uh, there are some more significant differences. But uh, for most of the contemporary maraja, the, uh, the rulings are pretty much the same. So uh, if perhaps you can see us after uh, and identify any other maraja uh, that you follow, then we can be prepared for any uh, particular issues with regard to that marja in the, case that they, in the event that they arise. Second, there are some masail that are specific to ladies. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to cover those. I think there is a session with uh, uh, Tahira Bai Kasmali, I believe, in, in early July. Uh, and she will cover those masail that are unique to ladies uh, as they pertain to you know, their, that time of the month for ladies and, and how they need to uh, perform the rituals in the event that uh, they, they find themselves in the middle of their cycle. Um, and so uh, we'll leave those as well for uh, Tahira Bai to cover. So we'll cover just the basic uh, masail that that pertain to, to everyone. <coughs> there are numerous verses in the Holy Quran that talk about Hajj. Um, one of them uh, talks about uh, Hajj being mandatory or obligatory on uh, all Muslims uh, once in a lifetime. But there are specific conditions that make Hajj wajib on an individual. Uh, one needs to be an adult. One needs to be sane. Uh, there needs to be both uh, physical freedom, financial freedom uh, to be able to perform Hajj. If the conditions of these conditions are not met, uh, then Hajj is not wajib on an individual. So some of the more detailed conditions would be, you know, you have to have the time. You know, these days Hajj takes about three weeks. Uh, you need to have the physical health and strength to be able to go for Hajj. Um, if you don't have, let's say, the financial means, uh, or you have the financial means now, but you don't have your health anymore, uh, then Hajj is not wajib on you. Um, there has to be no obstruction to the journey, which in these days there isn't. Uh, you need to be able to cover the expenses of the journey. And you need to have availability of means upon your return, meaning that uh, you know, if you're going to lose your job because you're going to be away for three weeks, and, and then to be able to earn a livelihood is a challenge for you then again, you don't have availability of means upon your return, in which case Hajj is not wajib. The other thing to remember is that there are certain obligations that you have to fulfill before you leave, right? Uh, and the most paramount of those is khums, okay? If you have a khums obligation on yourself, uh, you owe khums in this year, then you have to fulfill that obligation before you depart for Hajj, okay? 
if you have debts to other individuals that you can look after, then you should look after those. If you have payment arrangements for those debts, then that's fine. Uh, if you have a mortgage, for example, uh, which most of us do, then that's fine. You have an arrangement with the lending institution to be able to pay off your uh, mortgage on a monthly basis, or even if you have a debt that you have an arrangement to pay off, then that's perfectly fine. But otherwise, all other debts, particularly the debt to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through khums, needs to be settled before we uh, depart. There's another verse, so I'm, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to be sort of jumping back and forth between Masail and some of the spiritual dimensions of these uh, various rituals uh, in the interest of trying to be as, as quick as possible. There's another verse of the Holy Quran in Surah Hajj, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam to give the adhan for Hajj. وَأَذْذِنْ فِي النَّاسِ لِلْحَجْ and Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he had built the Kaaba, uh, the tafsir of this particular verse says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Ibrahim alayhi salam to give the adhan for hajj, meaning what? Meaning call people towards hajj. Ibrahim alayhi salam said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm here in front of the Kaaba. How is it that you expect me to give adhan that everybody will hear and be invited towards hajj? And the riwayah suggests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to Ibrahim by saying to him, give the adhan. It is my responsibility to make sure that everybody hears it. And so the riwayah suggests that Ibrahim alayhi salam stood in front of the Kaaba and he turned towards the east and he plugged, he put his fingers into both of his ears and he gave the adhan. And then he turned towards the west and he gave the adhan. And the riwayah suggests that everybody heard the Adhan of Ibrahim salam, when he gave it, even those who were not born at that time. And depending on the number of times, the individual responded back by saying, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, is the number of times you'll be blessed with the privilege of going for Hajj. And so those who have been to Hajj for 10, 15, 20, 30 times, mashallah, and there are several in this audience who have been uh, for Hajj for that many years, they responded to the call of Ibrahim alayhi salam as many times as they will be privileged to go for Hajj. Okay? And so this is one of the spiritual aspects of the call for Hajj. You know, many a time you will find that people uh, plan to go for Hajj and then something or the other comes up and they're unable to go for Hajj. People arrive there and are not able to complete the rituals of Hajj. And so this dua needs to be there continuously from the time you know we started the dua until we are able to complete our hajj allahumma rizqna hajj baytika al haram fi aami hadha wa fi kulli aam right recite one salawat for me please <laughs> hajj consists of two parts umrah tamattu' and hajj tamattu' umrah tamattu' has five rituals in it and Hajj Tamattu' has 13 rituals in it, okay? And there's some overlap, okay? So, Umrah Tamattu', five rituals. Ihram, the wearing of Ihram, the performing of Tawaf around the Kaaba, the two rakat that follows the Tawaf, uh, which is Salat of Tawaf, Sa'i, which is going back and forth between the mountains of Safa and Marwa, and then Taqseer, which is clipping of the hair or the nails. Okay, Ihram. Ihram, is the wearing of those two pieces of cloth in the case of men. But ihram must be worn at a designated place. And that designated place is called miqat. Depending on where you arrive uh, from into Makkah, the designated miqat varies. So depending on the direction in which you're coming from. Because this group will arrive from Medina, uh, the designated place for Miqat, for those come arriving from Medina, is a place called Dhul Hulayfa. In Dhul Hulayfa, there is a masjid called Masjid al-Shajara. And so that is where we will actually wear the clothes or perform the niyyah for putting on the clothes of Ihram. Okay? As far as Ihram is concerned, there are three aspects or three important aspects for Ihram. One is what are the clothes of Ihram. Two, what is the niyyah that one must perform when putting on the clothes of Ihram. And three, the recitation of that phrase that we call talbiyya. So what are the clothes of ihram? For ladies, regular clothes. However, you'll find that most women will wear white. Okay? But otherwise, regular clothes suffice uh, for 
uh, for women. The only exception is that the clothes should not be silk, okay, should not be made of gold or leather, but otherwise regular clothes uh, for ladies suffice. For men, two pieces of white unstitched cloth is what we wear for ihram. Nothing but those two pieces of cloth. Uh, and the ihram is available in Medina. So if you don't have an ihram here, uh, the hotel that I believe we're, we're, we're planning to stay at is the same one that we've been staying at for years. Just at the bottom of the hotel underneath, the, there's a store. You can buy your ihram from there, right? Otherwise, readily available in Medina at a very uh, you know, reasonable price. Clothes of ihram must be a tahir at all times. By tahir, we mean ritually pure, okay? Clothes, your clothes of ihram will get dirty. But dirt does not necessarily mean that it is najas. Okay? If it gets dirty, no problem. It will get dirty. But if it gets najas, the obligation is to change to a piece of cloth that is tahir or to make that cloth tahir. Okay? So uh, if you go to the washroom and your clothes get najas, you're obligated to change as quickly as possible. Or if you're bleeding and there is blood on your ihram, you're obligated to change the clothes of ihram as quickly as possible. Now, so the second aspect of uh, ihram is the niyyah, the intention. There were a number of hands that went up uh, for those who are going to hajj for the very first time. Okay? So there are generally three types of people who go for hajj. Those who are going for the very first time, it is your wajib hajj. Okay? Or you are going for hajj, you have been before. Okay? Uh, but you are going a second time or an nth time, but you intend to perform this hajj for yourself. That's a possibility. And the third possibility is that you are going for hajj. You have performed your wajib hajj already, and you're going back, and this time you want to perform hajj for someone else. Your parents, your grandparents, you know, uh, whoever it is that you wish to perform hajj for. So if you are going, and I'll cover this niyyah only once, uh, all the other rituals, the ritual changes, but the form or the, uh, the style of the niyyah remains the same. Okay? So if I am performing a hajj for the very first time, for those of us who are going for the very first time, the niyyah would be that I am wearing ihram for umrah tamattu' for hajjatul islam, wajib qurbatan illallah. Okay? And for most of us, that will be the niyyah. Okay? For the other, if you fall into category two or category three, we can, you can see me after, we can discuss the niyyah. But for the vast majority who are going for the first time, it will be that I'm wearing ihram for umrah tamattu' for hajjatul islam, wajib qurbatan illallah. And there will be niya cards that will be circulated for, uh, for convenience. But the other thing to remember is that like any other wajib act, okay, whether it is uh, hajj or even if it is namaz, there is no obligation to verbally pronounce the niya, okay? The obligation is to be consciously aware of what you are about to perform. Okay? The fact that you, are, you have that state of mind, that you are now wearing your clothes of ihram to start the rituals of umrah al tamattu that is sufficient. Okay? You don't have to say, I am wearing you know, ihram for umrah al tamattu for hajjat al-islam, wajib qurbatan illallah. You can. Some people prefer to do it that way. But there is no obligation to verbally pronounce the niyyah. Once you have put on the clothes of ihram, okay, which generally what will happen is that you will put on your clothes of ihram in the hotel. We will go to Masjid al-Shajara, and then we will perform our niyyah in Masjid al-Shajara, which means that the journey from the hotel to Masjid al-Shajara, you're not in ihram. You're just wearing clothes. For men, you just happen to wear two pieces of cloth, right? But when you arrive in Masjid al-Shajara, we will pray our Maghrib and Isha Salat. We generally go in the evening, and you'll, you'll know why. But we go after Maghrib, or we pray Maghrib and Isha there. And then we do our niyyah, and then we recite this phrase. Okay? And there'll be small groups where everybody will be uh, performing their niyyah together, and then we recite the phrase, Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk, la sharika laka labbaik. And this is a phrase that obviously you need to memorize. Uh, we'll recite it together once, and then it's recommended to repeat it as often as you can on the journey from uh, Medina to Makkah. Now, you will notice that in these clothes of ihram, right, there's again significance to some of these rituals. You, it is mustahab to perform ghusl, okay? That mustahab ghusl is akin to, you know, shedding your layers of sin that you have come to the city of Medina with, okay, as you're about to begin this journey. And then you 
take off all the clothes that you have brought from back home, you know, all the designer clothes that you have purchased from back home, all the brand names, everything comes off. All of us are going to the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the same two pieces of cloth. There is beauty in the simplicity with which we put our clothes of ihram on. Another aspect that is talked about by scholars is that these two pieces of cloth is like the kafan right, that we wear. This time the difference is that we have put on the kafan on ourselves as opposed to when we die and someone else puts, puts the kafan on to our bodies. It is symbolically suggesting we want to kill our inner selves. It is an opportunity to begin a new life once the journey of Hajj is complete. And when we arrive in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do our tawaf around the Kaaba, there is no distinction between black man and white man, between a rich man and poor man. Everybody arrives to perform tawaf of the Kaaba equally dressed. When you arrive and go into the haram, you'll see a sea of white. There's no difference. It doesn't matter what you are or who you are back home. Because the true worth of an individual is not in any of this that we hold important, right? And so this is a symbolic way of suggesting, look, when you come before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, you leave all of this pomp and glory aside. What you have back home, you leave back home. And it's supposed to be an awakening for us to realize, look, is that who we are? What is the true worth of an individual when we appear before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Once you wear the clothes of ihram, there are 25 prohibitions that immediately take effect when talbiyah is recited, right? So you do your niyyah, and then you recite labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik, and so on. It is like when you're praying namaz, or when you pray salat. You do your niyyah and you say, Allahu Akbar, and now you have begun your prayer. Now you can't look left and right, you're in the midst of namaz, you have to finish your salat. In the same way, once you do, just like when you do your Allahu Akbar for Salat and certain things are prohibited for you when you are in the midst of prayer, in the same way, when you recite your Talbiyyah, it is like doing the Takbiratul Ihram and now certain things become prohibited for you for as long as you are in the state of Ihram. Okay? And there are 25 such things that are prohibited for one who is in the state of Ihram. Some I'm, I'm going to cover very, very quickly. Uh, the others require a little bit more detail. Hunting and killing of insects. We don't hunt generally, but killing of insects not permitted in the state of Ihram. Okay, so if you have a mosquito or a fly or whatever, a spider that you are, that bothers you, um, you're not allowed to kill the insect while in the state of Ihram. Okay, you can swat it, you can move it away, but you can't kill the insect while in the state of Ihram. Okay, uh, intimacy with one's spouse. Okay, so we, for husband and wife that are going together, there cannot be any form of inti intimacy between the husband and wife. Um, reciting of nikah, um, not permitted in the state of, of uh, ihram. Unacceptable social interaction, where you're shouting and screaming and getting angry and using foul language and swearing and so on and so forth, that kind of behavior. Obviously frowned upon to begin with, but not permitted in the state of ihram. Carrying of arms, again, we don't carry arms into, while we're in the state of ihram, but this is, was a rule that was there even in the olden days. Then there are a few others that I want to cover in a little bit more detail. So wearing of sewn clothes, right? For men, as I said earlier, only two pieces of unstitched cloth and nothing else, okay? So no undergarments, nothing. It's just two pieces of unstitched cloth. Um, now, some people, you know, if you have a medical reason where you want to hold, let's say, your, uh, your medicine or whatever, and you need a belt, you can purchase a belt there, that that belt can be tied around your ihram, um, and you can carry you know, your, let's say, phone or, or your uh, medication if you, if you need to. For men, you cannot tie knots in your ihram, okay? The bigger concern that most people have is, uh, you know, the bottom piece of your ihram, you know? But you will find there are techniques, we'll, we'll, show, we'll show those who are with us, inshallah, in Medina, how to wear the clothes of ihram. To be honest, the bottom piece of ihram, which is the bigger concern for most men, is the most secure piece. It is the upper piece that tends to flip open when you are you know, uh, moving around or praying, it tends to, to open up. Uh, and that is uh, generally a bigger concern than the, than the bottom piece. Regardless, no knots permitted uh, in, the, uh, in either piece of ihram. If you wish to use a safety pin, you can use a safety pin only for the upper piece. 
Okay, so you can you can tie the two flaps together uh, for the upper piece so that it doesn't flip open when you go into ruku or sajda. For men, that is permitted. For women, like I said, regular clothes uh, not a problem, but no gloves permitted in the state of ihram. Looking into a mirror or reflective surface is not permitted in the state of ihram, and by this we mean that that look which is intended for beautification. Okay, so. In the elevators, there are mirrors. You go to the washroom, there are mirrors. If there is an unintentional glance towards the mirror, no problem. But if there is an intentional glance, where it is a glance of beautification to make sure that you're, you know, everything's looking OK, etc., your hair is in the right place, and so on and so forth, um, that look of beautification is not permitted in the state of ihram. Okay? Um, covering of feet for men. In the state of ihram, men are not allowed to wear socks or shoes. Uh, sandals, uh, as long as a you know, sufficient part of the upper part of the foot is exposed, or uh, flip-flops generally is what men will wear. Women, there's no restriction. You can you Obviously, hijab consists of wearing socks and, and covering your feet. Um, and so for women, wearing socks and shoes and sandals, whatever is comfortable, um, is, is actually a requirement. But for men, you're not allowed to cover your feet in the state of ihram. Beautification uh, in the form of uh, perfume uh, or surma in the case of, even in the case of ladies, uh, not permitted in the state of ihram. Okay? Um, eating foods and fruits that have an aroma to them is okay as long as you're not eating it for the aroma. Uh, our food generally tends to have an aroma to it. You know, Indian food is spicy uh, and has the spices that give it, you know, uh, uh, an aroma to it. There's no problem with that. Um, to plug your nose because of some, you know, foul smell, and there will be foul smells because the washrooms are being used by thousands of people, they're not that bad. The drainage system, the sewage system is a lot better than it used to be, uh, but there's still, you know, uh, an odor, and you're not allowed to plug your nose in, in that situation. You can walk away, you can move away, but you can't plug your nose. Other forms of beautification also not permitted in the state of Ihram. Um, jewelry that ladies wear on a regular basis. So if, if a lady you know, wears back home a necklace year round, okay, um, that is permitted. Um, because that is not something that she is putting on uh, specifically as adornment in the state of ihram. Okay, this is something that she wears year round. In the case of men as well, um, you know, no jewelry permitted. Um, rings, right? People generally tend to wear an aqiq ring, for example. Um, you can wear an aqiq ring, there's no problem, as long as you know for yourself that this, this isn't a form of beautification for you, that you're not wearing this aqiq ring because the stone is so large that you want people to see how large your aqiq stone is. Right? So as long as you know, and only you know, whether you are wearing these forms of jewelry as forms of beautification or not, okay? you will find many of us who um, go for hajj, even though we wear a ring uh, throughout the year, um, we'll take off the ring, we'll take off our watches, okay? Because the idea is that simplicity. The idea is you don't want that to become a form of distraction for you because you're looking at your watch versus someone else's or your ring versus someone else's and admiring uh, you know, yours over theirs. Uh, applying oil, um, even if it's unscented, okay? Uh, because we, I, I did mention this earlier when we talk about perfume, uh, you can't use scented soap in the state of Ihram because of perfume. Uh, applying oil, unless it's for medicinal reasons, you can't use oil. Cutting of your nails uh, in the state of Ihram, not permitted. Removing hair from the body, uh, unless it's unintentional. If it falls off, which generally, you know, hair tends to fall off from the head, or when you're doing wudu, for example, from the beard, sometimes hair, hair, hair falls off or having a shower. That's unintentional, that's okay. But otherwise, consciously removing hair in the state of Ihram, not permitted. Men covering the head uh, for men, not permitted in the state of ihram. By covering the head, we mean wearing like wearing a hat. Okay, you're not allowed to cover your head in the state of ihram. Uh, in the case for the case for women, you're not allowed to cover your face. Um, <coughs> the ear for men, you have to remember the ear. Sayyid Sistani considers the ear to be part of the head. Okay, therefore, um, when you are using your phone, for example, you can't cover your entire ear. Okay, while in the state of ihram. 
because Sayyid considers, Sayyid Sistani considers the ear to be part of the head. So people, you'll see them holding their phone in the oddest of ways. They'll hold it a little further away from their ear or they'll cover a portion of their ear uh, just to make sure that their ear is not covered in the state of ihram. Sheltering in shaded places for men. So when, um, when you are traveling, um, men, you cannot seek shelter while traveling from the sun or from the rain. Okay, this is one of the requirements of, um, of ihram. And this is the reason why we travel at night. Okay, when we go to Masjid al Shajara, we go in the evening and then we recite Maghrib and then leave because the sun is set. And so you're not seeking uh, shelter from the sun. If it rains, it's a different story, but generally it doesn't rain. You know, that, uh, it's, it's really hot in, in Saudi and it rarely rains. Uh, and so it's not an issue. But for those, for example, who are muqallidin of Sayyid al-Khui, rahmatullah alayhi, this was a, is an issue for them because he does not allow uh, seeking shelter, period. Uh, Sayyid Sistani says seeking shelter from the sun, in which case we travel at night and there's no issue. No issue in the case of ladies at all. When you arrive at your destination, then you can go into the building, it's not a problem, okay? Uh, or you can go into the tent, not a problem. It's just traveling uh, and seeking shelter from the sun is uh, uh, problematic for men. Bleeding uh, or, or causing yourself to, to bleed by, let's say, scratching yourself, if you know you're gonna bleed because you tend to bleed when you scratch, uh, then that is not permitted in the state of ihram. Uh, extraction of a, uh, of a tooth in the state of ihram not permitted in the state of ihram. If you're brushing and you tend to bleed when you're brushing, not a problem, it's unintentional, but all of those intentional acts uh, are not permitted in the state of ihram. And so that uh, very quickly covers the muharramat, those, those things that are uh, not permitted in the state of ihram. If you look at these 25 Muharramat, and there's no time to look at each and every one of them, but you'll find that there are some underlying themes as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or why the rules suggest that you cannot do these things, right? For example, one of the things that it teaches is the respect of Allah's creation, right? The idea of not killing insects, the idea of not hunting is supposed to teach us something. It's not supposed to be something that we just do in the state of ihram and then come back home and everything, life continues on as normal, no there is this implicit idea that one must respect the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Throughout our life from that point onwards. When we talk about beautification, jewelry, perfume, oil, you know, and so on and so forth, all of these are supposed to teach us that same thing that we said earlier, which is that, look, the worth of the individual, of an individual is not in all of these material things that he surrounds or she surrounds himself or herself with. That is not how Allah values the individual. There is something to be said about the simplicity with which we come before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And so all of these, if you look at them carefully, you will find that there is some underlying theme as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen these particular things to become haram on a person who is in the state of ihram. Okay. Okay. Now we arrive in front of the Kaaba. The journey from Medina to Mecca is, you know, it's difficult to say how many hours because it depends on traffic and you know logistics and you know government regulations and so on and so forth. But you know, in terms of kilometers, it's about a 450 kilometer journey from Medina to Mecca. Okay. Uh, but it takes us a, you know, a good full night to get there because of the buses don't drive as fast as, as they do here and, and there are a whole bunch of other issues as well. But we arrive in uh, Mecca uh, generally late night, early morning, just before Fajr or around Fajr time, um, just generally arrival time. And then depending on how much time we have at that point, whether, you know, the groups will decide whether we go for Umrah that evening or that night or we go after Fajr. Uh, our hotel is not very far from uh, Haram. It's probably a five, seven minute walk, so very close by, walking distance. Uh, but it's all about timing. Uh, if you get there too close to Fajr time, it's impossible to get in and do your tawaf because the crowds of Fajr have set in, right? But tawaf has five conditions or five requirements. One is the niyyah. 
the NIA is similar to what we said earlier, right? So depending on whether this is your first Hajj or you're doing it for, uh, again, for yourself or you're doing it for someone else, if I'm doing this for myself, uh, it's my first wajib Hajj, uh, I'm performing tawaf of the Kaaba seven times for Umrah al-Tamattu, for Hajjatul Islam, wajib, qurbatan ilallah. And you'll see that the form of the niyyah is similar to what it was, except that now the act of wearing ihram is replaced with the act of performing tawaf around the Kaaba. The form remains the same. The second requirement for uh, tawaf is that one must be ritually pure. Right? We said uh, by ritually pure we mean one must be in the state of wudu. Okay? There are only two rituals throughout Hajj that you must always be in wudu for. One is the performing of tawaf, and two is the namaz that follows tawaf. Namaz obviously we do in wudu, right? But tawaf and the two rakat namaz must be performed in the state of wudu, okay? Um, and if you're not in wudu, tawaf is null and void, you have to go back and uh, do wudu again and then come back. Now, if you are in the midst of, of tawaf and your wudu breaks, what happens? Okay. So the rule is that you have to remember is a rule of four. Okay. If you have completed four rounds, right, you go around the Kaaba seven times. If you have gone f time, uh, around the Kaaba four times already, and now you're in your fifth round or sixth round, and your wudu breaks, you come out, you do wudu, you go back, and you resume from where you left off. If your wudu breaks before the completion of your fourth round, your tawaf is null and void. You go out, you do wudu, you come back, you start afresh. Okay. So you remember the rule of four. If it's before the completion of fourth round, then uh, you, it's all null and void. You have to go back and, and redo it. But if it's after, uh, then it is um, permissible to uh, resume. The only exception there is that if you, if you voluntarily break it uh, or involuntarily break it, depending on certain uh, you know, rounds you're on, then the rule changes a little bit. But inshallah, we cover that in, in Medina. In addition to ritual purity, one must be physically pure. Okay? So we said earlier that your clothes of ihram must be a tahir at all times, must be free of najasat at all times. So what does that mean? That means that if, for example, there is blood on your, uh, on your clothes of ihram, you have to go change. Okay? But if there's, there's blood on your toes, right? and men, you know, this happens uh, uh, a lot because the crowds are so large, people are going to be stomping on your toes. It happens all the time. Okay? Um, and, and sometimes you can start bleeding as a result of that. Or someone else is bleeding and touches you. And now you have blood on yourself. Okay? Again, in those instances, you have to cleanse yourself of the najasat and then resume your tawaf. And the same rule of four applies. Okay? If it happened before the fourth round, you have to redo. If it happened after, then you, have, uh, you can salvage your tawaf by going out, clean, cleaning yourself, and coming back and resuming. Again, remember that if you uh, suspect that your toe is bleeding, for example, you have to look. You can't ignore and say, well, I'll look after the fourth round. And then, if, and then, and then hopefully you know, I, I can get it cleaned up after that. No, you have to look. OK. Um, <coughs> Okay, there are eight obligations as far as tawaf itself is concerned. Once, one is, the first is that every round of tawaf begins at Hajarul Aswad, okay, the black stone. Okay, and the group leader that you will go with will point out to you exactly where Hajarul Aswad is. They will show you the technique of how to begin your tawaf so that you do your niyyah just before you go around Hajarul Aswad. They'll say this is the corner of Hajarul Aswad, so people tend to do their niyyah here, so that when they cross Hajarul Aswad, their niyyah is performed and now the round begins. Okay? So every round begins at Hajarul Aswad. Every round ends at Hajarul Aswad. So going around the Kaaba until you get to Hajarul Aswad, that is one. Okay? So round begins and ends at Hajar. The left shoulder must be pointing towards the Kaaba at all times. And so as you go moving in that direction, OK? Um, if, however, for whatever reason, you get jostled out of position, OK? 
if you get jostled out of position a little bit, it's not a, it's not a big deal. But if you get jostled out of position to a point where now, let's say you're facing the Kaaba, or your back is towards the Kaaba, or you're completely 180 degrees, your right shoulder is facing the Kaaba, okay? If you don't move, if you're able to turn back and then continue moving, no problem. But if you take three steps in that position where you're now facing the Kaaba, and sometimes you just get pushed, so you, you move, right? If that were to happen, then you have to, that round is null and void, you go around, and from the point where you got jostled out of position, you resume your tawaf from there and you continue on, okay? It doesn't happen very often, okay? One other possibility is to retrace your steps back, which in Hajj is not possible because of the sheer crowds, okay? Generally, uh, for those who are going together with their, uh, with their spouse, you know, husband and wife going together, or you know, a father's taking a daughter, or uh, a mother and son, etc., where you have two people going together, Generally, they go together, okay? And, and two people getting jostled out of position is very difficult, okay? So you go together, you can, you can uh, if, uh, if husband and wife are going together, for example, you can decide whether the wife is behind and holding the husband or husband's behind holding the wife. And generally, the two of them can go together and guide yourself around the uh, tawaf, and, and generally, it, sh it should be fine, okay? You will find, and we'll show a picture in, in a minute, there's the, the uh, semicircle called Hijr of Ismail, alayhi salam. Um, one must go around the Hijr of Ismail when performing tawaf. Okay? Then you will also find a structure called the Maqam of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, where the footprints of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, are there. It is highly recommended to perform your tawaf between the Kaaba and Maqam of Ibrahim, so meaning you, your circle must be. In, in a picture in a moment. It is makru to do it outside maqam, okay? But it is possible. Sometimes for the elders, for seniors, it is not uh, easy to do tawaf within Kaaba and within, within that ambit of Kaaba and maqam of Ibrahim. But remember one thing, that uh, the further out you go, the bigger the circle. It's a long tawaf, the further out you go. It may be a little bit quieter, but it's a big tawaf. It's, it takes a lot longer, okay? If you are close to the Kaaba, okay, without touching it, A, the circle is short, it's a very small circle, the tawaf is a lot quicker, and it's actually quiet in that area, right? Just about maybe five to 10 people in from the Kaaba is actually a sweet spot, okay, where it's not that busy, the circle is, is smaller, and you can perform your tawaf reasonably comfortably. Okay, there is some pushing and shoving, obviously, but it's 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 very feasible to perform your tawaf uh, in that uh, ambit. Keep clear of the Kaaba when performing tawaf. You're not allowed to, let's say, drag your hands on the Kaaba while performing tawaf. You cannot touch the Kaaba while performing tawaf. However, if you're performing tawaf and there's an opening, it's your first time, and you're there for your tawaf, and you're overwhelmed with that emotion to touch the Kaaba and to cling on to it. There's no problem, but you pause your tawaf at that point. You go, you hang on to the Kaaba for as long as you want, you recite your du'as, etc. It is an overwhelming emotion, okay? And then you come back and you resume from where you left off. You cannot be walking and touching the Kaaba at the same time while performing tawaf, okay? So you can pause your tawaf if you have an opening. There'll be, inshallah, a lot of openings to touch the Kaaba, but if you, uh, sometimes, you know, you're just in that moment and you want to touch the Kaaba, there's no problem, but you pause your tawaf at that time. You have to complete seven rounds. So we said every round of, of, of tawaf begins at hajar, ends at hajar. Uh, you have to perform seven rounds around the Kaaba. Okay, that is tawaf. Tawaf is not one round, tawaf is seven. Okay. Now, if you have a doubt about which round you're on, okay, um, there are techniques that you know, we'll talk about of how to remember which round you're on. Each one has their own technique. If you're with someone else, with your husband, wife, mother, uh, brother, whoever it is, uh, if you have lost count and you don't know whether this is my third or fourth, um, then you can rely on your uh, partner's count. If they're certain it's our fourth round, no problem. There's certainty there, you can rely on their count and you continue on, okay? But there must be certainty about the number of rounds. You have to complete seven. You cannot think, you know, that, you know, was it six or seven? Was it seven or eight? I don't know, no. There has to be certain, certainty that it's seven, and you can't throw one in for good measure, right? 
uh, you have to be certain you completed seven, okay? But, you know, people use different techniques of, of remembering, and it's not that difficult. As overwhelming as it sounds, it's not that difficult to uh, remember which round you're on. It's, it's actually quite easy, okay? You, one must, uh, so if, if, sorry, if you are unable to resolve your doubt uh, about which round you are on, if it's third or four, you know, fourth or fifth, and either you're alone and you can't resolve, or your partner now also says, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe five or six, I don't know. If neither of you can resolve which round you're on, and there's no certainty, you start afresh, okay? There's no other choice. You have to be certain about which round you're on. The tawaf must be completed without considerable interruption, okay? Which means that generally, if you're performing tawaf between the Kaaba and Maqam, depending on the crowds, between 35 to 55 minutes. You should be able to complete your seven rounds. The further out you are, the longer it takes. Okay, but if you're between the Kaaba and Maqam, depending on how close you are to the Kaaba and how, uh, you know, how, how busy it is and, and how comfortable you are sort of navigating your way around for Tawaf, between 35 to 55 minutes. Okay? Now, if you wish to take a break, sometimes you know, uh, for, for seniors, uh, or sometimes even we find that others, younger people, you know, are overwhelmed with the crowd and the congestion. And some people will say, I, I, I can't take this anymore. I have to get out. Okay. Um, a brief break in the midst of tawaf is okay as long as it's after the fourth round. Okay. This round rule of four has to be one that has to be remembered. And what do we mean by a brief break? By a brief break, we mean you know, five, ten minutes. Okay. You can't take an hour-long break and completely interrupt the sequence of tawaf. Okay? If I'm observing you, you, know, you take a quick five, 10 minute break, you go out, maybe drink some water, and then you come back and you resume, okay, you took a break. But you can't just you know, hang out there for an hour and then come back and resume. Then you start afresh. That's too much of a break. Okay? But generally the rule is about five to 10 minutes. Tawaf must be performed free of movement, meaning that you have to be walking. Okay, now this for, for seniors who are on a wheelchair is a different story, but um, for those who are able-bodied, uh, we're walking. If you get lifted off the ground, right, because of the crowds, the same rule applies to when you got jostled out of position. If you move off your feet and you move three, four steps forward, you know, uh, not out of your own movement or own volition, then in that case, you have to come back and resume from where you got lifted off the ground, okay? It doesn't happen very often, okay? It's, some of these rules, even though they're in place, um, you will find that if generally if men and women go together, it, it doesn't happen very often, okay? For children, maybe, but for, for adults, uh, unlikely. Okay, okay. Uh, just a couple of pictures you will see um, of, of uh, you know, how this works. So between the Kaaba and Maqam is where you're doing a circle. You go around that semicircle, which is the Hajar of Ismail. And in terms of uh, positioning, the Hajar al Aswad is very close to the Maqam of Ibrahim. That's sort of a uh, sort of a, an aerial view. And that's another quick view of a really old picture. Um, and, and that's Tawaf. Now, Tawaf. Again, significance of Tawaf. Lots of significance of tawaf, right? <coughs> the fact that you know, in a, you go in a counterclockwise direction. Tawaf is performed in a counterclockwise direction. You know, there's symbolism to the idea that you are going against the grain. Okay, everything in this world goes clockwise. Even the clock goes clockwise, but we do tawaf in a anti-clockwise direction, counterclockwise direction. And there's significance of the fact that you're saying to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know what? I'm here to change. I'm going to go against the grain. I'm going to go in the opposite direction to what everything else goes in, right? You have your left shoulder must be pointing towards the Kaaba at all times. The left side is the closest side to the heart, okay? It is an idea, the idea symbolically is that I am now connecting myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? The fact that you go around the Kaaba and the only focus that one must have when performing tawaf is the Kaaba is symbolically suggesting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look, Going forward, I am going to try to make you the center of my life. Everything that I do in my life from this point onwards, I will bear in mind your pleasure. Because you need to be the center of my life. 
Okay? So there's a lot of symbolism um, in, in, in the performing of Tawaf, but again, in the interest of time, inshallah, we'll, we'll cover some of this. There are other speakers uh, who will be able to cover this in, in more depth, uh, inshallah, when we arrive in Medina and Makkah. Upon completion of your Tawaf, seven rounds are now complete. You've gone around Hajar al-Aswad, you make your way out. Uh, and now the next obligation is to recite your two rakat salat, your two rakat namaz, which is uh, to be recited behind the maqam of Ibrahim. Again, as I said earlier, the two rituals that you require to be in wudu for, tawaf and the namaz. So you have to be in wudu, and again, the same rules, you have to um, uh, make sure that you are in wudu and free of any najasat uh, when performing the two rakat salat. The two rakat salat is recited exactly like fajr. Okay? First surah, second surah, it doesn't matter which surah you choose, whether you recite loudly or softly, it doesn't matter. It is recommended to recite behind the maqam of Ibrahim salam, and as close to it as possible. Um, there is actually a designated place. You'll find everybody, everybody prays their namaz there. And so as soon as you're done your tawaf, you make your way to that area, you will see everybody praying. You pray your two rakat salat, you do your niya, you pray your two rakat salat, and you move on. You create, as, uh, you, know, you move on as quickly as possible, respecting the fact that thousands of other people want to come and pray their two rakat namaz, okay? Uh, inshallah, you'll get other opportunities to recite namaz there. Uh, but these two rakat salat that you recite uh, have to be recited behind maqam, and you recite it right after your tawaf is completed and then you move on to the next ritual. Next ritual is now Sa'i, which is going back and forth between the mountain of Safa and Marwa. I'm not gonna cover the Niyya. <coughs> you don't have to be in the state of Wudu. As I said earlier, the only two rituals that require you to be in Wudu are Tawaf and Salat. The obligation of Sa'i is that, you know, all of these rituals must be performed in sequence. So you arrive, you do your tawaf, you do your namaz, and then you go to perform your safa and marwa. Sa'i consists of taking seven laps, or walking seven times between the mountains of safa and marwa. The round begins at safa. So when you come out of the, the mataf area, which is the place where tawaf is performed, you uh, have recited your namaz, there'll be directions saying, you know, both in Arabic and Urdu as well, uh, you know, direct English uh, directions towards the mount, right? That's where your sa'i begins. And you walk from Safa to Marwa, that is one. Marwa to Safa is two, Safa to Marwa is three, and so on and so forth. Because you're doing seven rounds, because you started at Safa, you'll end up at Marwa. It's an odd number, and so you'll end up at Marwa. Now, you must cover the entire distance between the two mountains, Safa and Marwa. You'll see there's a slight incline towards on both sides of the mountain. You don't have to climb uh, and touch the mountain, but generally what people do is they tend to climb the incline. There's a pillar, people go, tend to go around the pillar just to make sure they're comfortable, uh, that they've covered the, the distance between the two mountains. Um, there's also been an extension in that area uh, a few years ago, and so, uh, it is uh, required that when you're walking from Safa to Marwa, because they've extended the haram outward, okay, uh, if you walk towards the edge of the, uh, of the building, you're actually walking outside the ambit of Safa and Marwa. And so it is uh, required that when you're walking from Safa to Marwa, you walk towards the middle lane. Okay, there's a wheelchair lane in the middle. Okay? So you walk from the left side, and you walk from Safa to Marwa. When you walk from Marwa to Safa, it doesn't matter. That the entire area is between the mountain of Safa and Marwa. So the sa'i can be performed on multiple levels. So the, it's a multi-story structure, right? Uh, there's a basement, there's a main floor, and then there's the upper floor, okay? We can perform sa'i in the basement or on the main floor, but cannot perform sa'i on the upper floor because that is above the mountain of Safa and Marwa, okay? I meant, uh, did not get a chance to mention this in Tawaf, but the same rule applies in Tawaf. The third floor, which is the rooftop, is above the Kaaba, and therefore we cannot perform tawaf on the upper floor. You'll see others, our uh, Ahl Sunnah brothers and sisters, performing tawaf on the upper floor, but we are not allowed to perform tawaf on any floor that is above the Kaaba. Okay? There's now actually a floor that is uh, not ground floor, but that is uh, first floor. Uh, you have to make your way there, but that is actually below the Kaaba. You can perform tawaf there, but then you cannot get a chance to perform your tawaf between Kaaba and Maqam. Okay. But your mustahab tawafs, you can choose to perform there if you wish. 
Um, okay. Um, I think I've covered this. Uh, doubts with regard to the number of rounds, same rule as Tawaf, right? If you're there with a partner, uh, you can uh, ascertain the, uh, with certainty which round you're on. There's no problem. Um, if you're on your own and you lost track of which round you're on, then you'd have to repeat again. But uh, it's not as busy as Tawaf, and so it's easier to keep a track of. Um, and, uh, and again, you need to have certainty as to which round you're on and complete that round. Um, okay. Um, Sa'i, significance of Sa'i. Again, a lot of significance of Sa'i. One of the uh, significances of Sa'i is this, this constant struggle that a human being goes through between uh, khawf and raja, right? Uh, khawf meaning fear of Allah's wrath and punishment for our sins, and raja meaning hope in his mercy, okay? And so this is, there is this constant struggle that a human being goes through between how he fears for the consequences of his actions on the Day of Judgment, while at the same time he has hope in his mercy for forgiveness, okay? One of the significances of uh, Sa'i, uh, there are others, obviously it is, a, uh, it is an act that is uh, a copy of what Bibi Hajra did when she was looking for water for her son Ismail. And so one of the significance is that this is a, uh, a search, just like she, see, she searched for water, this is a search for spiritual water, where you want a new beginning to life. And so there are numerous significances to uh, this act of Sa'i, but inshallah for, uh, for another time, inshallah. The last ritual of Umrah, now you have performed your Sa'i, is Taqseer, okay? Taqseer meaning clipping of the hair, which is what is recommended, or uh, nails. But most maraj say uh, clipping of the hair is preferred over uh, clipping of the nails. <coughs> this taqseer need not be done, now you'll find most people will do it on the mountain of Marwa. Okay? Just outside there, people will have scissors, you borrow a pair of scissors, you do your niya, and you clip your hair. Make sure that you do your own clipping, or someone who has already done his taqseer or her taqseer is doing the clipping for you. Right? Um, and, but it need not be done on the mountain of Marwa. It can be done um, back in the hotel. If you go back to the hotel, remember that you are still in the state of Ihram until taqseer is completed, okay? Um, and for men, obviously, uh, you'll find that some of the Ahl Sunnah will shave their heads. We're not allowed to shave our heads at this stage. After performing Umrah, it's only taqseer, just clipping a little bit of hair uh, or nails, uh, and that then uh, completes the Umrah. When Umrah is completed, um, all those 25 prohibitions that we talked about earlier are lifted, and now we're back in our regular clothes. You go, you have a shower, uh, you're back in your regular clothes, and now we're in the city of Mecca for uh, you know, however many days. I think we're probably arriving second or third of the Hijjah, which means we'll have five, six, seven days uh, before the eighth of the Hijjah when we leave for uh, Arafat. Um, okay, so very quick recap. Five rituals of Umrah, Ihram, Tawaf, two rakat namaz, Sa'i, and Taqseer, okay? Um, the Hajj al tamattu I will, I will cover a lot more quickly because uh, some of these rituals are similar. Tawaf is the same, the rules of Tawaf are the same, the Niyah is different, but Tawaf is the same, Sa'i is the same, Namaz of Tawaf is the same, and so on and so forth. Ihram, so it is recommended to wear in the afternoon or in the evening. Um, and uh, the recommended miqat in Makkah is Masjid al-Haram. And because we are literally walking distance from the masjid, we'll go, we'll, uh, we'll you know, put our, do our ghusl in the hotel, uh, put the clothes of ihram on, and then go to uh, Masjid al-Haram, recommended to recite two rakat salat uh, behind maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam, mustahab. Um, and then you do your niyyah. Okay. Uh, once we do our niyyah, we recite our talbiyah, labbaik Allahumma labbaik, and now again we are in the state of ihram. We go back to the hotel, and then we wait for our bus number to be called, and then we head towards Arafat. Okay. Um, 
Again, the requirement for ihram is the same as what we discussed earlier, three requirements. The clothes of ihram, same clothes that we talked about earlier. You can get them washed before uh, when we arrive after Umrah so that they're clean. Um, and then you're ready to put on your clothes of ihram. Uh, the niyyah, again, uh, is an important requirement of, of ihram, and then the talbiyyah, okay? The niyyah this time is that I'm wearing ihram now for hajjatul islam, wajib qurbatan illallah, okay? Earlier we were performing ihram or wearing ihram for umrah al tamattu. Now it is the second phase of hajj, okay? And so the niyyah is slightly different, but again, the form of the niyyah is the same. The second aspect of hajj al is the wukuf at arafah. Wukuf at Arafah is just nothing but staying at Arafah on the 9th of the Hijjah. Okay? So on the 8th of the Hijjah, we wear our ihram at night, midnight. We will take off uh, to arrive in Arafat. That night, we will sleep in Arafat. And we recommend that you sleep to get rest. You wake up for Fajr, have breakfast, take some rest again. Because the actual stay in Arafat is the afternoon of the 9th of the Hijjah, from Dhuhr till Maghrib. But we will arrive there earlier. We will arrive there earlier, A, for logistical reasons, B, because we as men cannot travel right, uh, in shaded buses in, during the day. And so we travel at night because of the rule that we discussed earlier. So we travel at night, we arrive there, plus we get our tents, everybody gets a chance to get some rest and so on. You do your niyyah. And really, the only stay, the only requirement for Arafah is nothing but staying. Okay? There's no other obligation, wajib obligation in Arafat other than to stay. However, the crux of Hajj is Arafat. Okay? It's the tradition of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam in which he says al Hajju Arafat. If you were to boil down Hajj into one ritual, it is Arafat. Okay, that is the one act that one goes for. Okay? There are traditions from our sixth Imam, for example, that say that, and we all know this, that you know, the opportunity for a human being to be forgiven, ideally is the month of Ramadan on the nights of Qadr, the holiest of nights in the Islamic calendar. But the sixth Imam says, for one who is not blessed with forgiveness, in the month of Ramadan, he or she does not get an opportunity like this again until the following Ramadan, except if he or she is in Arafat. Phenomenal opportunity for forgiveness. And there are traditions that even suggest that to think that you have left the plains of Arafat without forgiveness is a sin. So it's a golden opportunity and, and inshallah, we'll talk about you know, the things that you should do to prepare yourself for Arafat. It is a difficult afternoon because we're exhausted. It's extremely hot. People have not got a chance to sleep. It's uncomfortable. And yet, and we all find, even, even myself, you know, despite the fact that you, know, you plan to stay awake, you tend to doze off because it is that difficult. Okay? Like people doze off, and that's okay. You doze off, but make sure that you try to capitalize on as much time as possible in Arafat. Okay. It is a time, I mean, we will have the dua of Arafat, etc., recited together, but we consciously give people time, personal time, time for you to go outside, sit under the skies, ponder, reflect, speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever duas you have, right? And one other thing to remember is that, you know, <coughs> the Imam of our time is in Ghaiba, right? The one place that we know for certain that he is with us is on the plains of Arafah. Right now, we have no idea where he is. But on the day of Arafat, he is somewhere on those plains. And just being in the presence of the Imam of our time is in and of itself an overwhelming feeling. Because you know for certain the Imam is here somewhere. The veils that I have put on my eyes will not allow me to see him. But he is in my presence. Perhaps we may get a chance to meet him, right? That alone is an overwhelming feeling. Just recite one salawat, please. <laughs> Muzdalifa. So after Arafat, <coughs> you're, we're obligated to stay in Arafat until Maghrib. 
Okay, so we pray our Maghrib Salat uh, either in Arafat, depending on again logistics, uh, or we will go. We pray our Maghrib in Muzdalifa, but generally, uh, you know, we tend to pray in Arafat. <coughs> so that obligation is just to stay in Arafat from Dhuhr to Maghrib. Okay, then that evening, uh, now it has become the tenth night of the Hijjah. We will go to Muzdalifa or Mashar, uh, and again the obligation in.